as you, the most obvious difference, obviously, is the, uh, the fact that the room is smaller. <laughs> the reason for that is with the baby boom the church has been having lately and the overcrowding in the nursery and different challenges that we were having, we've had to expand and add an additional classroom. And so the solution that was come up with, that we came up with was to buy this dividing wall, middle wall partition here, and uh, erect it in the back of the classroom. And I think what's going to happen is when we're done with this class, we're going to scoot this a little bit this way. And yeah, we need to so, um, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to be in a little bit sure tighter quarters. Your chairs. But so um, right, honestly, pushed up and we'll be good. these types of problems are a good thing to have to deal with. I'd rather have to deal with trying to accommodate more people than less. <laughs> we can do it. So anyway, we appreciate you being here. We're going to uh, have lesson 87 this morning. Lesson 87. I'll tell you, these, these last few weeks have been extremely active. A lot of stuff going on. I'm very glad that I have prepared my, tried to prepare myself three weeks in advance because things are, the perspective seems to be changing slightly every week the more, um, the more studies and stuff that I'm able to, uh, to look into. This morning what I want to do is, we're going to talk for two weeks about Lewis Berry Chafer. And the reason we're going to do that is, number one, Chafer himself is significant and important. But even more than that is, he is very influential on one of the early leaders of the Grace Movement, and that is Charles F. Baker. So we, have to, we want to establish some things uh, along those lines as well. So Lesson 87 is titled, Lewis Berry Chafer and the Founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. So the introduction is, is, is short. It just says, while the Mid-Axe Movement was in its infancy in the 1920s, under the leadership of J.C. O'Hare, there, was, there were also new developments within mainstream premillennial fundamentalism. One of these was the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. So the first point I want to spend some time talking about is, is who was Chafer? Um, and so we'll look about, uh, about a few things about his life to start with. Lewis Perry Chafer, he was born in 1871 and uh, lived till 18, 1952 was a well-known American premillennialist, dispensationalist, founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, writer and conference speaker. Chafer was born in Rock Creek, Ohio, the second of three children born to a graduate of Auburn Theological Seminary, pre uh, Presbyterian slash Congregational Institution in New York. His father, Thomas Franklin Chafer, was a Congregationalist pastor, and Thomas and his wife, uh, Lormia Sperry Chafer, were devoted, caring parents. According to John D. Hanna, author of the entry on Lewis Perry Chafer in the Dictionary of Premillennial Theology, two events from his childhood greatly impacted Lewis's life. First, he was converted to Christ under the tutelage of his parents at the age of six during his father's first pastoral charge in Rock Creek. Second, in connection with his father's death from tuberculosis in 1882, Lewis was challenged by an evangelist named Scott who also was suffering from tuberculosis to pursue a career in Christian service. So his, his parents, his father dies uh, while he is still very young, and from that, apparently, based on the testimony, that he is challenged to pursue a career in ministry as a result. Lormia, now a single mother, struggled to provide for her family. After at least two moves, the family settled in Oberlin, Ohio, where Lorian managed a boarding house so that the children could attend school. Initially, Lewis entered the preparatory school attached to the college in 1889, and then the, and then the Conservatory of Music of Oberlin College. He studied music in the conservatory for three semesters, fall and spring 1889 through 90, and spring 1891. There are no indications that Schaefer took religious studies at Oberlin College or elsewhere. Financial constraints prevented further study. Beginning in the fall of 1889, he associated with A.T. Reed, an evangelist under the auspices of the Congregational Church in Ohio, uh, as a baritone and choir organizer in the meetings. So his earliest, um, his earliest ministry is going to be more musical than it's going to be uh, preaching or um, exp expounding on the scriptures or anything like that. He's a music student. His initial ministry is going to be involved in these evangelistic meetings and preparing and organizing the music that is going to be uh, accommodating the preaching. In 1896, he married Ella, Ella 
uh, Loria Case, whom he had met at Oberlin College, and the two formed an evangelistic team, Lewis preaching and singing with Loria playing the organ. They briefly settled in Painesville, Ohio, where they served as directors of the music program of the Congregational Church, though they continued to, continue to travel. In 1899, Lewis became the interim pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Lewiston, New York. Although in the fall of that year he began to have, he began a two-year ministry as an assistant pastor in the First Congregational Church of Buffalo. The initial year appears to have been an apprenticeship with a view to his formal ordination as a minister in the congregational community, which took place in April 1900. So he, he's, he's transitioning now. Obviously, he's taking on more responsibility other than just simply music and leading music and singing in, uh, in, in the different services. He's now um, being ordained as a minister in the congregational church in, in 1900. In 1901, Schaefer moved to Northfield, Massachusetts, where he operated a farm, and his wife served as an organist at the annual Northfield Conference. Now, you think back. You remember that in the early 1900s, there was this division amongst the... Um, uh, remember that the Niagara Bible Conference broke up, and they broke up over disagreements related to the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, and that Gabeline and Schofield and some of those men started a new conference, and... That new conference for a while is based out of Northfield, Massachusetts. So when Schaefer moves there, he becomes exposed to these guys that are these premillennial, dispensational, pre-tribulational guys that are now taking over, who view themselves as taking over the mantle of the now defunct Niagara Bible Conference. So that top point on page two again. In 1901, Schaefer moved to Northfield, Massachusetts, where he operated a farm, and his family served as an organist at the annual Northfield Conference. In 1904, the Southland Bible Conference was inaugurated in Florida, a counterpart to the Northfield Conferences. Schaefer was president of that conference after 1909. Through the Northfield Conferences, the Schaefers met an array of prominent evangelicals from both sides of the Atlantic. Among them were G. Campbell Morgan, F. B. Meyer, A. C. Gabeline, James M. Gray, and W. H. Griffin Thomas. So it's here where he's making some of the key uh, contacts and the key relationships that are going to be very decisive from his life moving forward. Okay. Now, if you look at the next point, where does where does uh, Moody or uh, yeah Moody fit into that? He was Northfield. Oh, I'm sorry, I was from He was from there, yeah. Um, <coughs> does anybody remember offhand the year Moody died? I don't remember the year. Um, I know Schofield did this. Yeah, he, he must have been before. What, 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 <coughs> I guess 1890. I think, somewhere in okay. By far the most important contact that Schaefer made in those years was with C.I. Schofield, who was then pastor of Trinitarian Congregational Church. Moody's home church in Northfield. So when Chafer goes to Northfield, Schofield is still the pastor of the church there that Moody had established. Okay, so they're they're living in the same general area in the same around the same city of Northfield. Schofield is the pastor of that of the congregational church there, and Chafer is now living there and getting uh, acclimated and, and acquaint acquaintances with all these different Bible teachers. Through this, but the most important one of these is going to be his relationship with Schofield. Chafer found in Schofield a clear, biblically oriented teacher, and the two were thereafter bound together in ministry for two decades. Schofield led the younger Chafer into his particular understanding of the scriptures as well as into a change of careers. No longer an itinerant evangelist, Chafer progressively joined his mentor as a traveling Bible teacher increasingly becoming a center participant in the Bible Conference movement. Generally, though, enlarged exposure in the Bible Conference and Bible and Prophetic Conferences, the publication of books and articles, and teaching in short-term short Bible institutes, Schaefer emerged in the early 1900s as a, as a quiet, energetic leader of one segment of the emerging evangelical movement. So his close relationship with Schofield is going to put him into 
obviously contact with more people, but it's going to open up other doors uh, of ministry, if you will, for Schaefer that he's going to be able to, uh, to, to, to use. So his, his focus is changing here, and he becomes a prominent member in the Bible Conference movement, traveling around teaching. He takes short-term positions, uh, lecturing at different Bible institutes and so on during that time period. From 1906 to 1910, he taught at the Mount Hermon School for Boys, instructing in Bible and music. Incidentally, his first published book was Elementary Outline Studies in the Science of Music, which he published in 1907. In 1906, he left the congregational community to, draw, to join the, Proy, the Troy Presbytery Synod of New York, <coughs> Presbyterian Church, USA. Reflecting his discomfort with liberalizing trends in the denomination and Schofield's ecclesiastical sympathies. His close identification with Schofield increased in the second decade of the century after Schaefer moved to Orange, uh, East Orange, New Jersey to join the staff of the New York School of the Bible, an agency that distributed Schofield's increasingly popular Bible correspondence course written in 1892. An office and, 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 sorry, Office for the Coordinating of Conference Activities. In 1913, he associated Schof he assisted Schofield in the founding of Philadelphia School of the Bible, uh, apparently writing the curriculum. Due to his growing Southern ministry, Chafer joined, joined the Orange Presbytery of the Presbyterian Church USA in 1912. So he's definitely, his focus is shifting as he moves through, and he's becoming increasingly more affiliated and associated with Schofield as the second decade of the 1900s is unfolding. Now, any questions about any of this or observations? Yeah, I think it's important to point out that it's a good thing that he was, I, I think personally, it's a good thing that he only was a music student at Oberlin College because um, Oberlin's most famous president is, is um, Charles Finney, uh, uh, the most famous revivalist of the 19th century and who is beloved by charismatics today uh, um, and his, some of his techniques, revivalist techniques are quite questionable. And, and, uh, he, You're talking about yeah, Charles Grayson Finney, right? Yes, uh -huh. he was, he was pr president of that school, uh, the second president of that school, so it's the, the theology of that school, I mean that tells me something about the theology mm -hmm. of, of that school. Well, did you have a comment? Now only that there's a, a thriving Grace Church right next door to Oberlin College, uh, and some of the roots for that Grace Bible College, that Grace uh, School, come directly from Oberlin years and years ago. Well, I appreciate that. That's Dr. Hudson's the one that introduced me to that group. Second point from the bottom on page two: Schofield's declining health, resulting in it resulting in increasingly limited itinerant ministry, brought another shift in the sphere and nature of Chafer's work. Moving to Dallas in 1922, he became pastor of the first Congregational Church, which had been founded in 1882 by Schofield. It was renamed Schofield Memorial Church in, uh, in his honor during Chafer's pastorate in 1923. Now we talked a little bit about this when we looked at Schofield. We talked about he founded the church there in 1882. Now, Chafer is coming to Dallas, and he is now going to pastor that church that Schofield founded back in 1882. And then he renames it in honor of his mentor. Um, the congregation renames it in honor of Schofield in 1923. Chafer pastored the church from 1922 to 1926, in addition to increased conference speaking. So now he's, now, so he's kind of been moving all over the place, doing a lot of different things sort of uh, following the needs, I guess, wherever they, where he felt they were, wherever they took him. And he ends up in Dallas um, uh, in, in, in 1922. And it's there that he's gonna, gonna found the seminary. So if you look at the last point on the, the page, Charles Ryrie, author of the entry on Chafer in the Baker Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, reports that Chafer moved to Dallas in 1922 with the express purpose of establishing Dallas Theological Seminary. So Ryrie tells it that he, the whole reason, the main reason why he went to Dallas was to establish the school. Um, he doesn't, he serves what, four years as the pastor of the church, 
But it's according to according to uh, Ryrie, his main reason for going was to establish the, the seminary. The school came into existence in 1924, and Chafer served as the president and professor of systematic theology until his death in 1952. Brian? Yeah. Why did he pick that area, do you know? Why Dallas? Mm -hmm. I, I really don't know for sure. Okay, I thought, I didn't know if there was a particular I'm sure purpose. that there had to have been some logistical reasons and probably the close proximity to Schofield um, and, the, and the church. You know, look, he's not going to be able to, he's going to have to have some means of supporting himself while he right. gets the school up and running. And I, I think it just probably to them seemed like a logical place to do it, I would guess. Uh, other than that, I don't have any any hard reasons for why they would have done it that way. So top of page three. It was originally founded as Evangelical, Evangelical Theolo Theological College in 1924. Chafer's obligations to the seminary forced him to resign from his pastorate as well as his secretarial duties from Central American Mission though he continued as a conference speaker. After starting the seminary, his publications mushroomed. By 1948, his advanced age, coupled with the burden of carrying on a school without secure financing, the growing turmoil over Schofielding dispensationalism in his own Presbyterian church, and the death of his wife in 1944, were factors that progressively limited his public ministry. After 1945, the operations of the school devolved to his executive, devolved to his executive assistant, John F. Walver. Chafer died due to heart failure while on a conference tour in Seattle, Washington in August 1952. So that's sort of some biographical background on who he was, what his associations and affiliations were, and how he came and ultimately ended up at Dallas and uh, founded what would eventually become Dallas Theological Seminary. So before we shift gears and start to consider his writing ministry, does anybody have any uh, other questions, thoughts, comments, or observations about the first point? Okay. Now, I'm not sure, does anybody know offhand who the current president of Dallas is? Dr. Bailey. Okay. How old is Ryrie now? He's still alive, right? Yeah, he's got to be in his 80s. Okay, and he he was the president for a time, I believe. No, he never was. No, it became the, uh, the it, it went from Walbert to to Swindell, Swindell. to Bailey. Yeah. Chuck Swindell. Yeah, really. There was a he's, he's still chancellor or. Or emeritus. Um, and, or and, and Swindoll took a definite anti dispensational approach. Yeah, that's where, that's that's where school, Dallas changed. Uh, shifted the school terribly. He's, he's right. Where, where is Dallas now in terms of theology? It's now it's not where it was. It's not here what, how it used to be. Chafer was, was the president. Now, and you, if you guys know more about this, you certainly can correct this, but I believe that the shift towards what is now being termed progressive dispensationalism started with some of the more modern professors at Dallas in the late 80s, early 90s. And what progressive, we're going to talk a little bit about that later on, but what progressive dispensationalism is, is a movement to try to reconcile um, dispensational theology with covenant theology. Instead of, and instead of emphasizing distinctives in the way God dealt with Israel compared to how he deals with the body of Christ, Progressive dispensationalism tries to uh, over, tries to emphasize similarities. Um, I think that's a simple explanation, at least for now. If you guys have anything to add to that, feel free to interject. No, but Swindoll, Swindoll helped make a big sh shift, in my opinion, in the wrong direction. And the other thing I would say, just in passing, about uh, Dallas Seminary is. One of the big, uh, aside from dispensational teaching, uh, they were systematic in their theology. Uh, most Bible colleges today do not cater to any form of systematic theology. It's called biblical theology as opposed to systematic theology. Yeah, we're going to talk more and about that's a, that's a fine point that most people won't get, but that's a very important point. Yeah. Anything else to add to that, Ronnie? 
I just wonder if um, any of the the neo charismatic movement of the 1970s was a part of that because the group that I was associated with all came up from Texas to Michigan. And also um, at the church where I work, we rent space to a Hispanic Apostolic Assembly, which is charismatic. And um, the pastor's wife, at least, um, went to Dallas Theological Seminary. I don't know. I can't speak to that, Ronnie. I don't know to what extent Dallas has catered to Pentecostalism. I do know that Schaefer would not have. Yeah. Um, from from what I've gathered from everything I've read, I don't I don't see him as really being real keen on um, you know Pentecostalism or the Charismatic movement. But this what you know this what happens in a lot of these institutions. The 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 people that found the institution do it for a specific reason around a certain set of beliefs. And then over time, you know, people come in after them that don't share their same convictions, and so they they change and alter the, you know, what what the institutions are are standing for and what they're about. And you know, that's a real problem, I think, with with some of these uh, with some of these groups. Um, but it definitely happened with with Dallas Theological when it started. It was it, it's not anything like it used to be uh, when it when it was founded by Mr. Chafer. Yeah. Why is Chuck Swindoll's name so familiar? Was he? A He's a popular TV radio preacher. Yeah, so He's written a lot, of, written books. A lot of books. He didn't um, last long there because his his <clears throat> attentions were divided between his radio ministry and he actually pastored a church. He never resigned the church that he's in, but he was uh, going back and forth. He's insight for living, right? Chuck Swindoll. He's, a, he's an evangelical free pastor. Yeah. That's what his denominational. Yeah. He never he never left that. He just jumped into Dallas. Now, Wolverd, Wolverd was a great, uh, very uh, dispensational fellow. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have stuff by Wolverd, um, and uh, you know he's he's standard Acts two dispensational writer. So, anything else on that regard? Okay, the next thing I want to talk about then is Chafer's writing ministry. Now the list that I have here is not exhaustive by any means. It's just a list of and a dating of some of the more major things that he wrote. Okay, so throughout his career, Chafer's writing ministry increased. The following is a brief sketch of his writing ministry. So, in 1909, he writes um, a book called Satan, and interestingly enough, uh, Schofield wrote the foreword for that book himself. 1911, he writes True Evangelism. 1915, The Kingdom in History and Prophecy which we'll have more to say about in a minute. 1917, Salvation. 1918, He That Is Spiritual. 1919, uh, Seven Major Bible Signs of the Times. 1921, Must We Dismiss the Millennium. 1922, Grace. 1926, Major Bible Themes. And 1933, uh, Bibsack. The Dallas Theological Seminary purchases or acquires the journal... Uh, Bilia Sarka and uh, Schaefer writes numerous articles throughout his career at Dallas for their for their uh, periodical, and then probably the most famous thing that he does is his uh, originally eight volume systematic theology book, which we'll have more to say about as well. I believe that that is now in more recent editions have condensed that I think to four volumes, but if you have the original set, it was, it was an eight volume set. They've kind of tried to, I guess, save paper and binding costs by taking it and cutting it in half and binding some of the original books together. But at first it was uh, written in eight volumes. In addition to institution, now here's why this is important. In addition to institutionalizing the theology of the Bible Conference movement through the establishment of Dallas Theological Seminary, Chafer systematized its unique theological emphasis with the publication of a systematic theology in 1948. This was significant because it was the first major attempt to set forth the teaching of dispensational premillennialism within the framework of traditional systematic theology. What, Schaefer's notes delineated, what Schofield's notes delineated in a dispensational approach to Scripture, Chafer's systematic, the, systematic theology simply enlarged. The work became the definitive statement of dispensational theology. It, for those of you who don't know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to take the time to go through everything here, but systematic theology 
is a specific approach, and what it does is it divides things up into categories. Okay? So, for example, uh, in systematic theology, they have what's called theology proper. Theology proper is the study of God. They'll have what they call um, angelology, for example. Angelology is a study of what? Angels. Angels. So there are nine, there's something like nine to ten what they call loci in traditional systematic theology. Some other ones would be ecclesiology, that's the study of the church. Eschatology is the study of end times or future events. Uh, they'll talk about soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Christology, the doctrine of Christ. They'll talk about um, anthropology, the doctrine of man. And so what they've done is they've taken the scripture and they've divided it into these different classifications. This is something that the Reformed tradition did a lot of. And so what's significant about Schaeffer's dis, uh, systematic theology is he's seeking to put, he's seeking to write the, the foundational tenets of dispensational premillennialism into a, into a systematic theological structure that educated and uh, the educated elite theologians would, un would, would be able to respect, as it were. Okay? So what he's doing here in writing this systematic theology is he's taking the doctrine of this premillennial dispensational movement in the United States. He's writing it, obviously, A, to the curriculum of Dallas Theological Seminary, but when he writes his systematic theology, he is stating the case for dispensational premillennialism within the framework of systematic theology. Okay, now to me that, that's the best and easiest way I can try to explain to you what he was doing. So when Lee's talking about Dallas Theological Seminary being systematic, that's what he's talking about. Um, when I was at Grace Bible College, the, one, of the, one of the classes that we had to take was a class in systematic theology, where they, we went through all these different loci and talked about what they were about and looked at different things. Uh, in relationship to them. So Schaefer's systematic theology is an attempt to set down in writing the, the main tenets of dispensational premillennialism within the framework here of systematic theology. Any, any questions about that? Systematic theology tends to be much more doctrinally oriented. Yeah. Doctrine is very important. Of course, that's one of the trends that I resist today, as you'll notice that churches are less and less interested in doctrine. In fact, uh, they'll flat out tell me, we don't preach doctrine here. Well, pray tell me what you do teach. <laughs> uh, but yeah. doctrine is very important in systematic theology. So, I know I'm, I haven't written everything up here, mostly because I don't want to take the time to do it. But these, this book, this just, these eight volumes then sort of become... The, the, the gold standard, as it were, for dispensational theology in the United States. So what Chafer does is he takes a lot of the basic things that Schofield states, he does make changes, and, and he's, not, he's not just par reparroting what Schofield said, he changes it and, and, and uh, definitely makes it his own in, in many ways. But it becomes then sort of the standard of what dispens the standard definitive statement of what dispensational premillennialism is about, and it's done in such a way. And this is what the whole BIBSAC, the, the journal, is all about: trying to take this and make the educated elite theologians within the different denominations have to deal with and respect dispensational theology as a theology. Okay. Because obviously we already know Harry Boltema is kicked out of the Reformed Church. We're going to see in a few weeks that Martin DeHaan is kicked out of the Reformed Church in America. Uh, these guys that are, that are espousing premillennial dispensationalism are being kicked out and removed in some cases from these mainline denominations. And Presbyterianism, being fundamentally Calvinistic in its approach, does not like a lot of this stuff either. And eventually, as we saw in those in the notes already, or alluded to in the notes, that within the Presbyterian Church, there's going to be a major problem here. Because most of the dispensational professors that are at Dallas Theological Seminary are Presbyterians. So when 
it becomes a big controversy in the Presbyterian Church, dispensational theology, it's going to cause a lot of problems for Chafer and the seminary over some of these things. But Chafer is definitely trying to set this up and to set in writing a definitive statement within the, within the confines of classical theology of what dispensational premillennialism is about. Okay? Pastor? Yeah. Just, just a comment on the books here. When I first came to see the word right and divided, one of the books that really helped me get a hold of it was this book on grace by Schaefer. Yeah. And of all the books that he wrote, you'll never find a clearer presentation of just what we mean by by grace and salvation. By it. It's a great, great book. Yeah. Everybody ought to be required to read it. When I was going through the struggle of changing my church from a Baptist church to a Grace church. Uh, this book helped me more than anything else because they would accept, uh, of course, uh, he was not known as a, a Baptist, but he was known as an independent. And so using Grace, uh, Schaefer's book on Grace really helped me in that struggle. And our church today largely became a Grace church today because of that influence. Mike? I could say the same thing. The first book that was handed to me was uh, Schaefer's book on Grace. Went, most of it went over my head at that time, but um, that was the first thing. And I think I had a conversation with Norm and that, that he was given that book uh, yeah. um, when I first became a Christian. Yeah, it's, it's, Another anecdote is when Fred, Fred and I attended the, the now defunct Grand Rapids School of the Bible and Music, and part of our tuition was for second year students was to be was to get we were required to purchase a set of the uh, systematic theology the eight volume set oh, oh uh, Grisboom, Grisboom as it was called was a sort of a satellite of Dallas a mini Dallas uh, except that it, that it was a Bible Institute and um, um, now Dallas it, it was published by Dallas Seminary Press Dallas has now let the let the copyright go go and they don't even use it anymore. Uh, Kriegel has picked it, picked it up, uh, being a reprint uh, publisher. And Are they the ones they, that have concised it to four? They now publish it, yeah. But uh, Dallas doesn't even use it anymore. So you had to buy that for class? We had, it was required. It was in our tuition. Yeah, that was Fred. Fred. Fred can tell you, too. Yeah. 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 You still got it? You had to oh, yeah. your house you to still, buy it. You still got it, Fred? Yeah. Okay. The one original one you bought in college? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I bought, uh, I, I got mine incidentally, um, Grace Bible College when I was a student had like, I don't know, probably four, five, six sets of it. And so they were, they, occasionally they would, when they got new stuff in or they, whatever, they would put certain books out on this table for like discount. And so I, I bought a whole used set of them for like $20 from, wow. uh, from the college when I was a student. Anyway, that really doesn't matter, but we're sharing personal stories, so there you go. <laughs> I did get a bargain. I'd, I'd agree with that. For, that book on grace is a supervisor. I, we, I debated. I, I, I really wanted to include more uh, discussion on that book. Maybe I'll look back and regret it, but for the sake of time, I, I chose not to because we're going to look at um, the kingdom and history and prophecy this week and his commentary on Ephesians next week um, because of the dispensational teaching mostly. For the purposes of the Grace History Project and tracing the resurgence of Pauline truth and the historical development of, mid of the mid ex movement in the United States, there are some statements in Chafer's 1915 publication, The Kingdom and History and Prophecy, that are worth noting. The introduction was written by Schofield and bears further proof of the close relationship these two men enjoyed. Among other things, Schofield states, following the Roman Catholic interpretation, Protestant theology has very generally taught that all the kingdom promises and even the great Davidic covenant itself are to be fulfilled in and through the church. The great theme of predictive prophecy is that kingdom. The New Testament reveals that the present age, as a parenthesis in the prophetic program, during which the church is called out from among the Gentiles, a stranger and pilgrim body belonging to the kingdom of God, but in no sense identical with the kingdom of heaven. So that, that's coming from this book right here. This was written in 1915. This is the Kingdom and History and Prophecy 
by Chafee. He writes it in 1915, and the, the introduction is written by Schofield himself, like I just read from. And uh, so that, that, that quote is actually quoting from Schofield's introduction. In chapter 1, titled The Theme, Chafer argues that the kingdom revelation is a distinct body of Scripture running throughout the Old Testament and New. In view of these facts, it may be helpful to note some of the essential values accruing from and conditions governing the study of kingdom truth. These conditions include the following according to Chafer. Number one, uh, Bible interpretation is incomplete without it. He's referring to the kingdom. Number two, knowledge of prophetic truth qualifies all intelligent Christians, Christian life and service. Number three, kingdom and prophetic <coughs> truths are being falsely represented. Number four, unfulfilled prophecy is as credible as history. Number five, prophetic language is equally, is equally as accurate as other scriptures. Number six, scripture must be rightly divided and applied. And number seven, there can be but one true system of interpretation. So those are sort of the governing <coughs> principles that he's setting out in, uh, in the book here, 1915, The Kingdom and History and Prophecy. Regarding the first condition listed above, the Bible interpretation is incomplete without it, Chafer stated, it stands to reason that since one-fourth of the Bible is in prophetic form, and five-sixths of the Bible is addressed to one nation to whom the kingdom promises are given, that any plan of study which avoids prophecy and ignores or spiritualizes God's covenants with His chosen earthly people will be incomplete, misleading, and subject to more human <laughs> assumptions. That's a great statement. He's saying, he's saying that one-fourth of the Bible is prophecy, and that five-sixths of the Bible are either written to or, or, adjust, or addressed, I should say, to the nation to whom that prophecy concerns. So any attempt that either spiritualizes or ignores it or in some way does not seek to understand prophecy for what it is will never lead anybody to the right interpretation or conclusions of Scripture is what he's basically saying. In the same section, Chafer admits that there are two distinct features of the, relig of the revelation given to Paul. So this is interesting. It has been pointed out that two distinct Revelations were given to the Apostle Paul in Arabia. He received directly from God the gospel of grace, which he was, which he has presented in the main in the Roman, in the Roman Galatian letters. This is a revelation of a new order, a new relationship to God, which is neither a perpetuation of Judaism nor a modification of that system. Judaism remains intact and follows its predicted course according to Scripture to the end. The new revelation of the grace of God which hath appeared and which is made possible by the cross should not be colored by the Judaic teaching. It is a complete system in itself and like Judaism continues intact to its predicted end. For what else, Paul, for what else is Paul contending in Galatians if it is not these two distinct systems should not, shall not be mixed. The second revelation came in the main from Paul's two years of imprisonment. This body of truth embraces the plan of the ages, the whole doctrine of the church, and its, and its present outcall and the present outcalling of a heavenly body and bride, as recorded in Ephesian and the Ephesian and Colossian letters. It is in this advanced body truth which is never comprehended apart from the exact lines of distinctions laid down in kingdom revelations. Oh, that's so he's, say, he's saying, look, in the revelation given the Apostle Paul, there are two aspects of this revelation. Number one, there's the, re there's the, the gospel aspect, and that that program should not be mixed with anything Judaic, anything related to the nation of Israel. And then there's also the information pertaining to the revelation of the church, the body of Christ. And he's saying this in 1915. In his comments on the second condition stated above, knowledge of prophetic truth qualifies all intelligent Christian life and service, Chafer indicates that he understood grace to be the governing principle of the current age. Quote, It is a serious mistake to press law observance in the face of repeated revelations that the believer of this age is not under the law as his rule of life. So also it will be found that at present 
Service is the accomplishment of divine undertakings never before revealed, and its motives are alone the mighty governing principles of grace. Amen. So, that's one reason why I, I, you know, look, I know that in his book, Grace, he expounds on that, but that's kind of a, a summary of what that book is about. It's about explaining how grace is the governing principle of the current age or dispensation. Expounding on point six, scriptures must be rightly divided and applied. Chafer argued the four gospels have no application to the church, but compromise, but comprise specific instruction to Israel. Amen. Quote, <coughs> it has been said, all scripture is for us, but all scripture is not about us. It all bears a message to us, but it is not all our rule of life. It will not do for Gentile believers to read themselves into the great portion of the Bible which treats distinctively, which treats distinctively of a chosen nation, still a separated people in the earth, under special unbroken purpose of God, and exactly what God intended them to be at this very hour. A right division and application of Scripture demands that a portion of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus be recognized as belonging to the divine covenants with one nation in which the Gentiles have no part. During these, during these uh, ministrations, Gentiles are not in view, nor can they be made to so appear by any fair method of interpretation. He's, I mean... He's laying it out here just as clearly, in my opinion, as, as anybody that I've ever heard expound upon these things, that you cannot, if you're going to rightly divide the Bible, you can't read into the Gospels the things that pertain to the church. <coughs> the final paragraph in chapter 5, titled uh, The Kingdom and History and Prophecy, clearly states that Israel's earthly blessings have not been transferred to the church because of Israel's unbelief. Quote, to concede that these literal earthly blessings for Israel were transferred into spiritual blessings for all nations because Israel rejected and crucified her king at his first appearing compels one to ignore the bulk of the Old Testament prophecies and the plain promise and teachings of Jesus. The oath of Jehovah still stands and he knows no defeat. His plan has not been changed. To speak of the kingdom as postponed is to consider it within the perspective of Israel's final glory. So he's saying, we don't, we're not teaching that the kingdom's never going to come. We're not teaching that we should spiritualize and take all these prophecies that God gave Israel and apply them to the church. What he's saying is what you do is you just understand that, that the kingdom has been temporarily what? Postponed. Postponed. And that all those promises, all those promises await a yet future fulfillment. In chapter six, present titled "Present Truth," Chafer says much more about the current dispensation, with which a mid-act dispensationalist would agree. Consider the following statements: "Quote: These new unfoldings of grace and truth that will be seen are in no way related." or a part of those earthly kingdom revelations which have been previously recorded by the sacred writers. Much is in contrast between these two bodies of truth. But it is even more important to see that a great difference lies in the fact that one treats of a celestial sphere of spiritual reality, which is as much above the temporal earthly covenants of the other as heaven is higher than the earth. Christianity is totally opposite of Judaism. And any mixture of the two must result in the loss of all that is vital in the present plan of salvation. One, uh, one, made, in appearance to the, one made in appearance to the limited resources of the natural man and, con and condition his life on earth. The other sets aside the natural man, secures a, a whole new being in Christ Jesus, and counsels that new being in his pilgrim journey to his heavenly home. Amen. Further, that same chapter, quote, It is never said of any Old Testament saint that he was a member of the body of Christ, or that he was accepted in the Beloved. 
But the New Testament say, is all this, and has been made the righteousness of God in him. Quote, next quote. As truly as the Christian is a new creature and a heavenly citizen, so every condition within the new life is supernatural. The human limitations have been perfectly anticipated and provided for in the fact that the all-sufficient Spirit indwells every saved person. This universal abiding presence of the Spirit in a saved person, providing nothing short of the sufficiency of God for the least of His children, is a vastly different relationship than had been known before. And last quote in this section, the epistles of the New Testament present a distinctly heavenly rule of life within, uh, with, which is sorry, graciousness in contrast to the law. They instruct the heavenly citizen in his normal walk in life. Attempted obedience to these precepts will never make a heavenly citizen. They are rather set before him because he is already a heavenly citizen through the power of God. Therefore, they do not carry a legal imperative but are presented as beseeching, and under the, suggest, uh, the suggestive phrase, as it becometh saints, a new governing rule of life is given to those who are looking back, in sa looking back in saving faith to Calvary. Obedience to the new principle of life under grace, obedience to the new principle of life under grace would not save one. It only suggests the normal manner of life for those who have already become heavenly in, in, being through, in being through the alone sufficient power of God. The new principle of life through grace is superhuman, but according to the purpose of God, it is to be perfectly fulfilled by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So, look, that's 1915. Before... O'Hare, before a lot of these things, it is clear that Mr. Chafer understood some highly significant dispensational truths, particularly about how God operates today in the dispensation of grace. Chapter 6, the, titled The Church Which Is His Body, <coughs> bears witness to the standard Acts 2 arguments about the information of the body of Christ and the revelation of the mystery. Chafer begins the chapter by stating the new purpose of God in this age is seen to be the outcalling of a heavenly people. They form a part of the kingdom in its present mystery form, but are in no way related to the messianic earthly kingdom of Israel other than, other than that they, as the bride of the king, will be associated with him in his reign. We've talked about others that have said that, argued that the church is the bride of Christ. Not only does Chafer argue that the church began in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, but he also states that Christ spoke of a yet future church three times during his earthly ministry. However, in the very next paragraph, Chafer speaks of the church which is his body as a secret committed to the Apostle Paul and fully set forth in the books of Ephesians and Colossians. Top of page 7. Quoting now that, that statement, The fuller revelation of the church which is his body was committed to the Apostle Paul. Her foundation being, and destiny is the theme of the prison revelation and forms the basis of the prison epistles, especially Ephesians and Colossians. The Apostle writing of this special revelation given to him concerning the purpose of God in this dispensation of grace records that there was a mystery, or a sacred secret, not made known in other ages, but revealed to himself and the other apostles and Gentiles who were to become fellow heirs with the Jews in one body. A Gentile blessing had, a, had been a foreview of the Old Testament and was associated with the earthly kingdom glories of Israel. But Paul's revelation is of a new formation into a new body, a new creation. Partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, which is not found in the Old Testament. So, he shows here the standard sort of dilemma that exists for Acts 2 dispensationalists who argue that the church started in Acts 2. The idea, they clearly read in the Pauline epistles that the mystery of this dispensation was, was revealed to Paul first, yet they have it beginning before it was before Paul's even saved. So again, that's a 
we, we observed this with Darby, we observed this with Trotter, uh, we've observed this already even with early Schofield, that even Schofield, it, or, I'm sorry, well obviously Schofield, but I, I meant to say O'Hare, that even O'Hare for a time uh, st was still believing and teaching that the church began at Pentecost, even after he had accepted no water baptism for this dispensation. So you see within Schaefer the same, the same sort of, of, of struggle uh, to, to identify. When he expounds upon Ephesians, he's very good. He explains things, in my opinion, exactly the way I, almost exactly the way I understand them. But then, I don't know if it's because of uh, tradition or what, they still all come back to saying that the church had to have begun at Pentecost, even when they understand that the church was a mystery and that um, the events of Pentecost were fulfillment of prophecy. Now, one other thing I want to say about that quickly is this. As I'm reading ahead, I'm now reading some stuff that I think dates from the middle of the 1930s. Okay? The first guy that, may, that, that points out the argument that the events of Acts 2 are the fulfillment of Joel 2, and that it explicitly says that these are the last days and this individual makes the argument that how could the last days of how could the commencement of the last days of Israel with the coming of the Holy Spirit be the birth date of the church? The first guy that I've read that's making that argument is Charles F. Baker, which is highly fascinating to me because Mr. Baker sat in Chafer's church. Chafer was Mr. Baker's pastor, and Chafer was his professor when Baker was at Dallas Theological Seminary. So, it's interesting to me that he would make that argument because that seems to be a, an argument that has not occurred to Mr. Chafer when he writes this book and the one we're going to look at next week. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Ronnie? Um, <clears throat> birthday of the church is something that I hear a lot in the grace movement. I've never read it in the Bible. Dispensation mm -hmm. is in the Bible. Um, I don't know as it's absolutely necessary to figure out a birthday for the church, but from reading through your lesson here and what Schaefer is teaching, um, it looks to me like he, th he believed that the dispensation of grace was not a mystery to Jesus Christ in, while he was on earth, that he alluded to it in some ways. Um, that the dispensation of grace began at the cross that it was revealed to Paul early on that the dispensation of grace, just that part of it, was preached throughout Acts, but that the purpose of it was revealed later and was preached in the prison epistles. That's a mouthful. That's, that's why I, I, I don't, these, these Schaefer quotes. I could see where, I could definitely see where I don't think that's very far off from what he is what he is saying. There are other statements, particularly in the one we're going to look at next week, where he uses that terminology of the church began at Pentecost or the birth date of the church, and he pit, and he pins it on a specific, you know, a specific uh, event or time. Yeah, but do we need to pick a birthday for the church? Well, what we need to recognize is when did God begin dispensing grace? Lee. Well, I think that's a, a valid question, and that's exactly the reason why, even within our mid-Acts position, uh, we've got Acts 9, Acts 13, Acts 28. Uh, I don't think, you know, there's good men are going to disagree as long as we're here. And, uh, in fact, if somebody could figure that out, it sure helped me. Uh, I would like to say, I think that book you're holding, unless I'm mis uh, mistaken, that book there is very rare. That's one. It's the only book that's never ever been reprinted. Yeah, so I never never put that back in print. Yeah, and I it was never put in, <laughs> and there's a reason for it because it's so very close, close to systematic theology and the grace message, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's very close. The, for me, the the main issue is this: as I've thought about this, I don't. For me, I'm not really. I don't care so much. If there's disagreement as to Acts 9, Acts 13, whatever, that doesn't, 
what what starts to bother me is when you have the church starting before Paul. Yeah, I agree. that's the thing. That's what if I if I've got an Acts thirteen guy and an Acts nine guy and this and that and the other thing, and I have my own opinions about that. That stuff doesn't bother me. What bothers me is when you start it too soon or too late. That's 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 what I think the key is because I, even as Mike has pointed out last week, I've, I'm reading in O'Hare that even he changes his mind and he says for a while that the church began before Paul wrote Romans, which is obviously before you get to the end of the book of Acts. But he's not trying to say, well, boom, right here in this chapter, there it is. That's when it. That's when it began. So I'm more concerned with that than I am with saying, here's the exact nanosecond when the church began. Yeah. In order for Paul to be saved and become the pattern for how all of us are to be saved, all of the judicial stuff that allowed God in his righteousness to dispense pure grace had to already be in effect. And so that God could save Paul purely by grace, because Paul certainly did not deserve under the Jewish system to be um, an heir of salvation. And I agree with that. That's what the Pauline revelation is about. And Paul so. didn't know it, but God already knew it and all had already begun. Uh, in order, otherwise he would not have been able to save Paul. I would say, now we're sort of, I don't want to, I think that in, in God's mind, yes, the provision had been made. The, he was satisfied with the work of his son. But from the point of view, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's what philosophers <coughs> would talk about in, the different, in, the, in what they call the order of uh, knowing. In the order of knowing, God knows it's done. Mm -hmm. in, the order of our, in order of humanity knowing everything that was done, he hadn't chose to tell everybody yet. So, there's a mystery aspect of the cross and what Christ accomplished at the cross that is held back with, the, with that mystery truth. And it's that truth that God reveals to humanity through the Pauline revelation. So even after the cross for a time, until that revelation is made, God is still dealing with humanity based on the parameters of what He has already told them. Okay. Well, he's clearly still offering the kingdom to yes. Israel. However, when Stephen prayed full of the Holy Ghost, asking that they be forgiven, even though they had committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ had said that that can't be forgiven in this age or the age to come, the parentheses had to begin there because it can't be forgiven here or there. Um, that, the Holy Spirit asked, asked that they, that Israel in fact, be forgiven. And God had to dispense grace to Israel, even though they've been set aside, and to us. I think that, we're in, I think that the point in history where Israel is rendered in unbelief is Acts 7. Mm -hmm. I think Acts 28 is too late. Mm -hmm. I think that what you have at the end of the book of Acts is the end of this time period where things are moving and transitioning. And that's why, that's why for me, Israel is rendered in unbelief in Acts 7. Yeah, and, and that, the that church goes cannot, along with Romans too. And, yes, and the church cannot be formed until Israel is what? Set aside. Set aside. But, but they're declining. But I agree with you, though. There's a sense here, Ronnie, that at the cross, God knows everything that is being accomplished here. Mm -hmm. Okay? What Paul does is he looks back and says, hey, there's some stuff about this that was what? Mystery. That was a mystery. It was all bought for and paid for and accomplished here, but he doesn't know humanity doesn't know anything about it until God reveals it to who? Paul. Paul. But God saves Paul on the basis of that before he reveals to him what Yes, because he's already accomplished it there. Right. Yes. The to uh, we need to get two points to finish quick. The totality of Chafer's comments reveals the following, what I consider inconsistencies. First, he says that Christ spoke of the church three times in the Gospels at a time when he, was, when he has previously argued extensively that the kingdom of God was being offered to Israel. Second, he states that the church was a mystery not revealed until God caused the Apostle Paul to understand it. 
How then could Christ have spoken about the church, the subject of the mystery, before it was revealed to Paul? If Christ spoke of the church, which is his body, and the Gospels, then it was not a mystery when God revealed it to Paul. In addition, on pages 76 through 77, Schaefer argues using Ephesians 2, 11 through 18, that the body of Christ could not be formed until the middle wall of partition was broken down. Yet he does not explain how this happened prior to Acts 2, thereby allowing Acts 2 to be the birthday, if you want to use that term, of the church. In conclusion, it should be noted that much that Schaefer says in the kingdom of God in history and prophecy about grace being the operative principle of God during the current dispensation of grace is in his 1922 book, Grace. And that's partly why I've elected not to add a third week on Schaefer and to dissect that book because I think if you can understand these summary statements, you can understand the gist of what he elaborates on in that book. Yeah. Regarding Christ possibly alluding to the mystery in anything that he ever said on earth, I don't see where that has to be impossible in order for it to remain a mystery because simply I as a parent may know something and may even um, give veiled hints of it, fully understanding that my kids aren't going to get it until later when I tell them outright and then they look back at it. I, Jesus Christ wasn't just man. He was God in human flesh and he and it certainly was not a mystery to him. He may have chosen to keep his mouth pretty much shut about it and certainly You have no idea, Ronnie, what a can of worms you're opening with that statement. Because that statement has caused a lot of this debate about whether or not Christ knew the mystery when he was on earth has created a lot of friction in some grace circles. How could he have not known? There are some that are, and I don't know, I'm not, don't attribute this to me, okay? Because I don't know what I think. But there are some that argue that in the incarnation, that what happened is that God, that Christ in becoming flesh, set aside the free exercise of his will. Meaning, he, I, see, I, I'm even uncomfortable stating it because I don't want so I don't want it to be hooked to me because I'm not saying this is what I think. But that when Christ becomes, when, through the incarnation, when God becomes unit, uh, incarnate human flesh through the person of Jesus Christ, that there's an aspect of that where the second member of the God had gave up certain as freely set aside certain aspects of his um, divinity. He grew in grace and knowledge. And was limited, limited himself explicitly to what the will of the Father was at that time. Kenosis. Okay, so there's definitely that view out there which would then go along with the idea. And, and, and again, the word church does not mean body of Christ. All the word church means is a called out assembly. So when he says to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, almost all grace interpreters, at least I think, and uh, will, will say, well, that doesn't have to be the body of Christ that he's referring to there because he's referring to Peter and the, the group of believers that he's going to build and is in the process of building uh, those, that, that Jewish kingdom church or that little flock that is being built. So those are just some of the ideas that are out there uh, that are circulating amongst different grace um, grace teaching on that. But most of them will certainly not say, most of them will certainly say that, look, if it was a mystery and it was not revealed, it was unknown to the sons of men in ages previous, then there's no way that Christ in his earthly ministry would have alluded to it until the timing was right and the plan and purpose of God for him to reveal it. So I, I think we have to remember that Christ in what we call the hypostatic union was both God and man. In his yeah. deity, of course, obviously, it wasn't anything he didn't know. But in his humanity, he grew like anybody else in wisdom and in stature. Uh, I think that uh, there were certain things that uh, he laid aside some of his prerogatives. To this. I think that's what you just said. Too. Yeah, basically. So that's one idea that's out there. But we're like five minutes past, and we got to quit. I do appreciate your attention and the discussion. We will finish up with Schaefer next Sunday.